Atheist Nomads, episode 96. News for May 30, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, Atheist Nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 26, 27, 40. (laughs) We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 96. I am Dustin. Wesley is unable to join us this time around, so filling in for him is Lauren Studley. Hi, everybody. For those of you who don't know who Lauren is, uh, she is the Vice President of Idaho Atheist. She's been on the show twice before, once as a guest and once joining us for the news. And she is also my fiance, and that is, well, soon to change. Uh, We're getting married. Yeah, yeah. We decided to move it up a little, um, because we're cheap and weddings are expensive. Yeah, so so when is that going to be again? (laughs) <laughs> it is going to be June 13th, 2015. Okay, and as a result of that, um, I will actually be, you know, and this episode is late, and I do apologize for that. Um, I will be working on the podcast continuously for the next six days. When I'm not at work, I will be recording or editing, and hopefully Wesley will be able to join us for the, the next couple. Now, because the goal is to have two weeks off from the show the week before and week after the wedding and to not have you miss any episodes right so we're preparing ourselves for a very drunk and or grumpy dustin for the next (laughs) week (laughs) oh yeah yeah anyway um we hit the three-year mark last saturday uh so that was the uh 23rd and so may 23rd 2012 uh we released the first episode Aww, and yeah, that was pretty cool to get to the three-year mark um we decided not to do anything special for the three-year mark because episode 100 is coming up so soon you know just you know four episodes away yeah but you know what's special about 96 it's backwards for 69 oh <laughs> nice fist bump fist bump yeah, this is the, the only the second episode where everyone, at least with me recording, having everyone in the same time zone and same location. Thus, fist bumps. Yes, yes. And so anyway, uh, episode 100 is coming up. We got the break coming up. Three years uh, are, are down. For episode 100, we are planning on a uh, live Google Hangout on air. Watch Facebook and Twitter for more details on that and also watch the, you know, upcoming episodes i can't guarantee we'll have the details in any of those since i will be yeah we will have all of them done before next thursday adam miller has dropped his lawsuit against uh, stephanie gitormson uh, he was the faith healer who was suing her for defamation and copyright infringement for her fair use of his videos to tear him apart and uh yeah he dropped it all so Yay! Yeah, this victory. is happening more and more, I think we're seeing, where people will be using specific videos or speeches, and then they'll be told they can't. But it's... Heck, it's on YouTube! <laughs> it's it's, it's usually use. on their It's just usually on their own website, free to use. But, man, when you start tearing somebody's arguments down... Yeah. Yeah, and I've looked at the YouTube licenses. You have two options. Creative Commons which makes people more free to use your stuff or the standard YouTube license, which means it needs to be linked back to them and it can be used in response videos, which means you are responding to what somebody said. 
So like somebody tearing apart the claims of a faith healer who posted the video to YouTube is totally fair use and within the spirit and letter of the license. Yeah, it's kind of why YouTube exists. It's not just there for cat videos. That's all I use it for. But I mean, other people use it for intellectual debate. I mostly use it for vaping videos, but yeah. Anyway, we are also starting a new segment, and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into that now. As you are all aware, I I hold a, a BA in theology, um, graduated cum laude with that from what is now Walla Walla University. It was then Walla Walla College, and I have minors in history and biblical languages, and I did a year of study in the Master of Divinity program at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Uh, Lauren has suggested that I am not putting that degree and study to good enough use on the podcast. I, I agreed with her after some some discussion. He tries to hide his diploma on the bookshelf, and that's just sad. I actually, for a long time, hid it in my my file box. It being on the bookshelf at all is a big step up from that. Yeah, I think I grabbed it and put it on there. No, you didn't. From somewhere. It was sitting down on oh, the shelf. I had- put it up. It had just fallen because of stupid gravity. It reminds me of onions. <laughs> we need to get a proper holder for that. Walla walla to onions. Hold it up. Oh yeah, we'll put it up on the wall somewhere. Oh, or we could do that. Yeah. Anyway, um, so with this this new segment, uh, I will be uh, addressing various topics from theology, religious belief, and other relevant bullshit. And of course, questions from listeners are definitely welcome. Uh, I will be moving through material, but getting. Extra material from you is always helpful. Are you going to be discussing Seventh-day Adventist stuff in particular, or is this going to be a grand overview of all religious insight? There will be a mix, but it will, for the most part, be from an Adventist bent. Good, because those people are crazy, and they are so much fun to listen about. (laughs) So, uh, and some of this may end up, we may actually just do a full-on interview episode where Wesley interviews me about my background. Um, so, and maybe one on just going into the Adventist church and we have had another ex Adventist on the show. Um, so it might be interesting to get, just have have an episode on Adventism explicitly. Uh, and the other ex Adventist was Ryan Bell. Um, anyway, now the best place to start with anything is the beginning and that would be the garden of Eden. Uh, It's not the beginning in any kind of reality, but it is in all of their beliefs and their holy book. It's also a restaurant uh, stop between uh, Boise and Idaho Falls at Twin Falls. Yes, it is. And so this actually won't be the only time we'll be covering this very short story. Uh, But the basic rundown is that God created the heavens and the earth and he made this perfect garden, which is where he put Adam and then later Eve. Present in this garden were two magical trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both of these trees produced magical fruit. One gave you eternal life, the other made you smart. Adam and Eve were told not to eat of the tree of knowledge, but they were free to eat from any of the other trees. After they ate that forbidden magical fruit, God decided that they had to be ejected from the garden so they couldn't eat from the tree of life. Because if they did, they would be like God, both living forever and knowing both good and evil. Uh, You may wonder why God would put a dangerous forbidden tree there that produces dangerous magical fruit that gives you knowledge. Super brainy knowledge. Why would he why would he even bother doing that? And and the answer, at least from the the Adventist perspective, uh, informed by the writings of the church's prophetess Ellen G. White, and we'll we'll talk about her in more detail at another time. Cuckoo. uh, Is that after Satan rebelled God agreed to put temptation in front of every other intelligent being he created. Yes, Adventists believe that there are other intelligent beings elsewhere in the universe and that each planet has a tree of life and a tree of knowledge and that humans are the only ones who failed the test. So we're the only ones who needed a Jesus to save us from our, I guess, from being created in the image of God. Uh, So anyway, what this suggests is that God did not create perfect beings. Instead, he created curious beings with a terminal addiction. They had pure, innocent curiosity, so the offer of the serpent to gain knowledge would be quite the temptation. Because who doesn't want knowledge? 
And if you can get knowledge, especially of these very foreign concepts like good and evil, from just eating a little bit of fruit, who's not going to take that up? And then once they succumbed to that temptation, they were deprived of the medication, the drug that God had them hooked on, and they began to die. The process taking more than 900 years. Yeah, pretty ridiculous. Uh, Conservative Christians, or at least Adventists, believe that this actually happened, but they blame it on the existence of free will, not the inevitable product of innocent curiosity. They also believe that in heaven, there is a tree of life and that the access to it will allow immortality and a restoration to the perfection that we would have had if we were born in the Garden of Eden free of sin. That perfection includes growing to nine feet in height. And being dumb as a rock. Apparently. Uh, anyway, this, this is one reason why I don't care for debating with believers. They believe that knowledge is dangerous and that it can be a temptation. They believe that knowledge can deprive them from the tree of life. And their night footness, right? What? Eventually they would want to be nine feet tall. Yes, yes. Nine footness. I, 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 okay, I get that now. Yes. Yeah, that's, um, that's unfortunate for the human race there, buddies. <laughs> yeah. It's time for this day in history. And Lauren, as the uh, Phil and Wesley, is going to be covering that. Yes, think of me as Wesley, but with boobs. Glorious, glorious boobs. <laughs> He's marrying me for my intelligence, I swear. When, when they, they named the Grand Tetons, they were thinking of Lauren. Future Lauren and her future Tetons. All right, so today, <laughs> well, not actually today, we kind of messed this up, but this is just so, it's, it's a fun story, so we're going to deal with it. Um, on May 30th, this day in history, tomorrow, but you won't know that because this will be released. Hopefully tonight. Oh, well, maybe. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> May 30th, we are talking about the death of Joan of Arc. So a lot of people know of Joan of Arc. They kind of have an idea of who she was, but they don't really know about everything that actually led up to her death. Um, mostly, I say that because I didn't know. <laughs> I only just found out off of uh, Wikipedia. Go Wikipedia. And um, so I'm just going to kind of go over what actually led to her demise. Um, at the age of 13, uh, she thought she saw visions of St. Michael, St. Maria, a couple other saints in her father's garden. And people believed, okay, that she's, she must be chosen. She must be, you know, some kind of divinator. Um, and as she aged, she found herself wanting to become more involved in France's uh, military uh, practices. Um, she figured if, if there was no one else in the country, at least she should be by the king helping him address military problems with England. Um, she felt this so strongly that she went to a couple lords and and finally uh, got their ears. Uh, at one point, she actually guessed uh, when the French battles were going to fail, but she guessed it several days before they could have known. So they, mm. again, kind of upped her as being, um, you know, a, a hearer of God's words. Um, but that wasn't exactly what got her, uh, got her sent to trial. They couldn't just send her to trial for heresy. Uh, heresy is one of those crimes that you have to do at least twice. And at this point, she had only, they could think, have done it once. So they had to come up with another crime that she was guilty of that they could add on so that they could actually send her to, uh, for send her to trial and get capital punishment. And they decided that that was going to be cross-dressing. Um, any woman in the military knows uh, <laughs> that you are under danger of being sexually assaulted. One of the best ways to avoid this sexual assault is to wear men's garb. Uh, men's garb all connected with buttons and zips and stuff to uh, be one single piece versus a dress, which offers no protection. You just flip up for easy access so throughout her entire military career the whole three or four years she was doing this she dressed in men's armor uh she had her hair cut short because long hair didn't make sense on the battlefield couldn't keep it in the helmet couldn't protect her was getting in her hair or getting in her eyes all Can't sorts keep of it stuff clean. yeah uh, it would have been a mess so they decided okay so she was a cross-dresser 
but she again had only crossed just once. They needed some other. They needed something else. Uh, what they found is when they put her in prison, um, that she was again being sexually assaulted. Uh, so to prevent molestation, she went back to men's clothing. That was the cincture. She was cr- she had cross dressed twice. She had a uh, heresy up against her. She had a uh, judge and court that was totally against her. In fact, everybody agrees that um, the pro English faction um, that stacked it against her. Uh, the charges were made up. The everything was just totally against her and illegal. Even the church agreed that the jury had to be made up of equal uh, clergy, equal peers of different beliefs not in her case she got all the pro-english clergy and um there was no debate whatsoever that this was an illegal trial but they went ahead and did it anyway and she was condemned to death and sentenced to die she was executed by burning on may 30th 1431 uh the well, the image of her death is kind of one that we've grown up with you know she was tied to uh, a stake she had I believe two or three crosses on her person, um, one on around her neck, one stuck in her belt. They burned her at the stake, raked up the ashes, burned that a couple more times just to make sure that nobody could collect any relics, um, because even they knew at that time that she was probably going to be declared a martyr for this. Uh, then they cast her into the river. The executioner, Jeffrey uh, Thiraj, apparently thought that he was going to be damned for uh being the executioner for this wow so everybody knew it was wrong but they did it anyway but it was because of her that the french rallied and was able to make any kind of progress in the uh, hundred year war at all if it weren't for her then the entire war probably would have fallen apart and the european landscape would look a little different now i think yeah and one thing that's kind of interesting is uh yeah you kept using the term english uh in the the politics that were going on at the time, the King of England had a preferred title of Duke of Normandy, not King of England. It wasn't until really about after Joan of Arc that they actually started identifying as English and started speaking English in the court. Before that, the court in London was was speaking French. Uh there was an, another event that did also help uh, push the the acceptance and use of the title King of England, and that was the uh, crusade where King Richard and King Philip were crusading together. Philip was Richard's lord as King of France, while uh, Richard was Duke of Normandy, uh, but Richard was a much better commander. So he needed to start going by King Richard, not Duke Richard, to uh, make it so that it wasn't wrong for him to be giving a king orders. Well, it kind of makes sense. If you want to get the job done, nobody's going to listen to a duke. Yeah. And one other factor that I think you would appreciate with the Hundred Years' War is that the English, the the Norman forces, did so well because of the Welsh. Aw. The Welsh longbowmen, in particular. Very nice. They're good for more than just digging up coal, apparently. And I say that because Lauren's like, half welsh yes i about yeah give or take i probably have some welsh in me with the last name of williams which is of welsh origin we haven't found it you're mostly new jerseyan <laughs> on on that side which i will continue to f- flaunt at you for uh, the rest of your life on that on the the williams side yes the, the clark side is more recent from from england and canada and the south where they anyway um <clears throat> moving along it's time for a quick break and then we'll be back with science and technology we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheist nomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheist nomads or better yet call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666 we might even play it on the show You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. A fourth hominid species dating to the time of Lucy, about 3.3 million to 3.5 million years ago, has been identified from remains from four individuals. 
Of note, their jaws were more robust and teeth smaller than other hominids of their day. And these bones are, well, not very complete. Uh, anyway, it has been named the Australopithecus diarmida. This is so cool for anybody who is into any kind of um, human history. This this is big. This is like Neanderthals, but Lucy times. So like three million years prior to the Neanderthals. I wonder if they could determine what the gender was. If there was a male, they should call it Rico and Lucy. Oh, ah. yeah. No, that's awful. Don't don't do that. <laughs> But yeah, um, Ethiopia, Ethiopia again, center stage for the birthplace of uh, the hominids. It's pretty cool. Um, one other thing of of note, I don't think you have it here, is that they have finally determined that humans must have left Africa via um, Egypt before there was some thought that maybe they left uh, further. What would it further east? Southeast, when Africa was kind of pushed up against the continent a little bit more, but now mm. they have determined that it was actually through the Nile, the Delta Nile area. So that's okay. cool. Okay. All right. And moving to space, LightSail is a CubeSat or tiny little one liter satellite with solar sails. Now, the plan for this Planetary Society mission, which Bill Nye the Science Guy is the CEO of, was to send telemetry for 30 days and then deploy the sails and test the attitude control. It was only going to last a few days before returning to Earth. Unfortunately, a bug in the flight software has left it frozen. Probably because something in the attitude control went off, right? <laughs> uh, actually, no. It's every 15 seconds it sends a telemetry packet and saves a copy locally. Once the local file reaches 32 megabytes, it can crash the software. The manufacturer has found and fixed that bug in later software versions, but LightSail has an earlier unpatched version. They did make several attempts to issue reboot commands, and those were all failed. Um, So they're now going to have to wait for a charged particle to hit the electronics just right to force a reboot. Something that typically happens within a few weeks for a satellite like this. And once that happens, they'll probably issue the command to deploy the sails early. Uh, next year, they do have another mission plan where they will actually test controlled flight. That's, that's going to be the exciting one. Yeah. Well, and the amazing thing with, with solar sails is, you know, you look at early human uh, seafaring, and it was a long time of people rowing. And then people started harnessing the wind. And with space flight, We've been using really crappy conventional engines. I would say the equivalent of rowing. And now we're going to get sails. What's well, beyond sails then? Warp drive. Oh, okay. Let's just go straight for it then. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, anyway, the sails, they're, they're, the way they're, they're supposed to work is protons have a little bit of mass. And so every time they hit this, this reflective sail, um, they impart a little bit of momentum. And we'll slowly accelerate it as long as the solar sail is within, uh, you know, is getting light from the sun, it will continue to accelerate. So this wouldn't be great for a short distance mission, like, say, to get to the moon. We can get there with conventional rockets in a few days. A solar sail would take weeks. But to get someplace like Jupiter, this would be pretty freaking awesome for it. I could also imagine a, a uh, scenario where they might use it in conjunction with other engines to get the initial speed up and then deploy that, uh, a, a very massive, maybe a couple kilometer solar sail to uh, continue to accelerate without needing more fuel. I was just thinking, how, how does it stop? Because if, if it's always going forward and it's always increasing velocity, then it's going to just smack into something. Well, in water, if you cut the engines, you slow down because of a lot of drag. In space, there isn't much drag. Right, so it would just keep going. So to stop, uh, you have to get into orbit. Um, You can use orbits to either slower or speed up your your travel. Um, You can also enter atmosphere to slow down, gain access to some drag. That's basically how I stop when I ski. Hmm. I start going too fast, and I just get hunkered down and then fall over. Well, you, you need to stop the falling over part and use the 
create some 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 friction, some some drag to um, do some nice controlled movements, like I do on a snowboard when I'm drunk, or what I do when I'm skate skiing or skating and I just fall over. Yeah, it's controlled falling. Ah, that's that's the key. Uh, snowboarding is actually all controlled falling. Well, technically, even walking is controlled falling. Damn it. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Uh, according to the Conservative Tribune, and yes, I am taking an article from the Conservative Tribune. I have not fact-checked any details in this. It is glorious and beautiful as written. Uh, archaeologists have found an Egyptian mummy mask that contained a fragment of the Gospel of Mark. These masks are made of layers of recycled papyrus and apparently often include multiple fragments. They claim that they found a fragment from the book of Mark that dates to 80 AD. Uh, They go on to claim that atheists have had a fit about it. They only actually talk about Bart Ehrman and describe him as a militant atheist, even though that sure seems far from an accurate description even if you accept that militant atheists can be an accurate description of somebody who is not fighting in the name of godlessness. They fight. They just fight over whether or not how much cream they're going to put in their coffee. That's about as much fighting as I've seen from a militant atheist. Yeah, uh, but but to really be militant, you need to be using weapons and... Goons! Beer bottles. Uh, Shanks! Anyway, they described him as a a militant atheist and quoted his objections he, he leveled on Facebook or at least that they claim he made on Facebook to uh, them destroying the mask to make this. And uh, quoting from the article, uh, this goes a long ways to disproving the claim that the Gospels were literary inventions that took place centuries after the life of Jesus. End quote. Just to make sure it's very clear, that's where their words stop. Uh, However, Mark is generally believed to have been written sometime around 70 C.E., That'd be 40 years after the alleged Jesus' alleged death and about 50 to 20 years after Paul's oldest epistle. And that dating is based on the amount of variation between fragments and is pretty widely accepted among both believers and skeptics. A copy found after it was originally written does nothing to bolster the accuracy or historicity of the original. And considering it's only a single fragment of unknown origin, it doesn't even get us closer to what the original may have said. To get closer to that, you need to have multiple fragments so you can compare how they line up against each other. We know what the textual tradition was in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century. Pretty good and pretty accurate copying. We don't know what the textual tradition was in the 1st century. And the fact that this was found in Egypt is pretty meaningless and pointless because any kind of writing was very expensive back then. And so it's not like it's something that somebody would have likely just thrown away. Okay, eventually it did get thrown away in Egypt. Uh, but somebody probably moved and they had a copy of it. Right. Finding a copy of a story doesn't make the story any more true. Yeah. Especially when the copy is from about 10 years after the story was written in the next country that's like third edition we're talking a hundred like less than a hundred miles or 200 miles away it's pretty close so uh i i do want to also say though that textual fragments are incredibly rare and they are very valuable so i actually don't see anything wrong with destroying what is a mundane artifact an egyptian mummy mask to get to a rare artifact a transcript or a manuscript fragment from an early, uh, important book. You know, it, when I was in Jordan, our biggest finds were not all the little fertility figurines, wasn't all the bones, wasn't the pottery, it wasn't even the walls we uncovered. It was two little pottery shards, one with eight characters written on it and one with two. To find writing from the, the time period is immensely valuable. And apparently the mummy masks weren't even all that well made either, so... Or at least not well preserved. Yeah. They, they They weren't of, of museum quality. Which makes me wonder how many mummy masks are just wandering around out there. If if only a few are deemed museum quality, somebody could have a mummy mask in their, like, basement. If it's anything like Jordanian pottery from the late Iron II period, the good pottery shards are 
property of the Jordanian government and will be leased out to universities to reassemble. And the rest is waste, garbage. At our dig site, most of what we found was pottery shards. And most of it was dumped out into a garbage pile. Uh, Not even for tourists? We were allowed to take some back. I took a, a small piece. But tourists don't go to a site like that. No. Wasn't complete enough yet. All right. Well, that's it for science. We're going to take another quick break, and then we will be back with politics and religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine or Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. Our first story is the Josh Duggar tale. Uh, This is horribly overplayed, so I am actually going to do very brief cliff notes. And there are no links in the show notes from it because there's so many freaking stories and articles written about this. Uh, The key thing is Josh Duggar was the oldest son of the Duggar family, a quiverful family that has gotten a lot of attention and press. And he violated four other teenagers, uh, including... and adolescents. Uh, The youngest was 11, and he was 14 at the time, and four of them was his sisters. One thing that I have found troubling with the reporting on it is that they keep calling him a child molester, which when I think of the term child molester, I think of an adult with a small child, or Uh, even a teenager. The man in the van? Yeah, or even a teenager with a prepubescent uh, at most, and given the current trends on when puberty is happening, uh, the the most extreme age difference was three years. He was 14, so likely about a year to a year and a half uh, post-puberty. The victim was 11, likely about a year past puberty. I am not excusing any of that, but it was at least within the same age range. So calling him a child molester is not accurate. Uh, concerns about the safety of his children, I do not think are justified. And I have seen those. What we need to call this is what it actually is. Sexual assault. He violated, you know, snuck up on girls while they were sleeping and fondled their boobs and tried to finger bang them. That is sexual assault. And it was with people of the same age range. Um, So I don't think calling it child molesting does any good and if anything it helps muddy what the term even means and if you start muddying terms too much they stop having meaning and value uh i also think a area that has missed that this could have been used for a lot of important uh or for some some good points that were missed is that they were all homeschooled in a conservative christian home within conservative christianity All sin is equally bad in the eyes of God, which would mean him fondling his sisters, fondling a non-relative consenting girl of his of appropriate age and him masturbating would have all been of equal wrongness. All would have been sin. They also didn't even know the proper names for the body parts Uh, At least the girls didn't know. They they knew their breasts were breasts, but what they called their vaginas was private. That tells me that they did not have any kind of sexual education at all, which in a quiverful uh, homeschool, I would not expect there'd be any sex ed. And if you're not even giving people the uh, important, uh, the proper names for the body parts, and you're not telling people how sex works then I'm going to guess nobody's talking about what consent is and what it means. A 14, 14, 15 year old horny teenager who isn't even told about consent. Yeah, we can fault him because he still shouldn't have done it, but his parents actually deserve a lot of the blame. 
No, the parents and the pastor that they went to. The pastor, the church elders, uh, the cop, they told about it. Yeah, those those people were all equally in, at fault, I believe. Yeah, um, they, they put him into counseling with somebody who was not a counselor, not a therapist, not even a pastor. It was somebody with a building restoration company, and he worked for the summer. Rather than putting him into counseling, they put him with a... Put him into a summer job. Thought he needed to work it out of his system. Oh, and do worksheets, too. Um, yeah. Pictures of the worksheets have been going around. And oh, the big uh, debacle has been the part where it at the, the worksheet is asking the child, you know, what did you do to promote this sexual assault on yourself? Mm. This is for the, the girl's side. Um, were you uh, flirting? Were you showing too much uh, skin? Um, victim... You know, it was a victim blaming yeah. portion of the worksheet that is has gotten a lot of people upset Damn. too. I mean, the whole thing was backwards. Yeah, and you know, I think if they had at least gotten him to a licensed therapist who could help him work through the strange, sinful feelings he was having, and help him find proper outlets, not fondling his sisters while they sleep. I think we could possibly give them a pass. But what this story really shows is the problem. some of the problems that come up when you allow religious people to get a pass on proper standard curriculum. And one of the big problems with homeschooling. When somebody is homeschooled, they are free of the, the standards, which means you can go through a homeschool course, make it to adulthood, and not know the proper name for what's between your legs. Means you can make it all the way through without knowing what consent is. How it works. Because, let's be honest, uh, consent isn't as simple and straightforward as it seems. There is a lot of rape that happens because guys are stupid. I love the vid. There's a video out there where one guy decides to uh, describe consent by um, using tea mm-hmm. as as an example. You know, if for example, if if you ask somebody if they want some tea and they say no, you cannot force them to drink the tea. If somebody says yes, I'll have some tea, and you give it to them, and then they say mm, no, nah, I don't really want it anymore, you do not force them to drink the tea. You just don't. If the person is passed out because they are drunk. You do not try to force more tea down their throat. Drunk people or passed out people do not want tea. That makes us very simplified, Mm -hmm. but still an issue. I do like that the the focus has moved to teaching men what consent is and what it means. That is the right way. Oh, and girls too. Yeah. Um, Women who don't really know what consent means... They go to college and they start going to fraternity benders. They don't know that they have rights sometimes. Mm-hmm. Some of these girls, they don't realize that, or they are told by their fellow girls that it's their fault. And, yeah. you know, if you are, if you know what consent is and you can stand up and firmly say, no, I don't want any more tea, then it is a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. This really needs to be starting, I think, and it ties in with the bullying we talked about a couple episodes ago. Uh, there is age-appropriate education you can start doing in kindergarten about consent, bullying, assault, and sex. Well, I know for a fact that in kindergarten, first grade, they're always having to teach boys and girls not to touch each other in certain mm-hmm. ways. And, you know, it's it can be as simple as, you know, don't hug if the person doesn't want to hug. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't have to be... This is a vagina, and this is a penis, and this will go in here someday, and it will feel really good, but not now. It's just, people freak out and jump to this horrible conclusion. It's like, no, you just need to learn that when somebody says they don't want to hug, you don't hug them. Mm -hmm. And keeping it age appropriate. There's an appropriate level for kindergartners. There's an appropriate level for fourth graders. Needs to get a lot more in-depth in middle school, where bad things are becoming a lot more likely to happen, where the bullying is more likely to get more violent. And where non-consensual hugs are more likely to turn into groping. And if, but if you start all of that at day one and you slowly build on it, they aren't hard concepts to grasp. Oh my God, it's like the South Park episode. 
Do they try to teach the kindergartners how to put on a condom? Yeah. <laughs> we don't need Start to go, with day one. We don't need to go that far, but age appropriate does. It it works. And I also think private school and homeschooling should not be given the pass that it is given. There should be standards established by the state that applies to everyone. And there should be standardized testing for people who aren't, whose education is not under direct state control to ensure that those standards at all levels are being met. And if they aren't being met, then you need to get a properly qualified teacher to fix it. So I would say an 11 year old, a 12 year old getting to being able to not being able to identify what's between her legs. That is a failed education. Yeah, but people will freak out when you start telling them that the government is going to tell them what to teach their kids. Somebody has to, because look what happens when they don't. (laughs) Girls get groped in their sleep by their creepy older brother. No, he was the first son. Maybe they figured it out a couple boys later. (laughs) (laughs) By the time the police got involved, it was more than five years after the fact. The girls still didn't know what to call their bits. Vagina. Ah, God fucking damn. Uh, Let's let's go ahead and move on to some good news. Uh, Oregon Governor Kate Brown, the first openly bisexual governor, has signed into law a bill that uh, that has been called the Youth Mental Health Protection Act, and it is a ban on gay conversion therapy for minors. This makes Oregon the third state to institute such a ban, joining California and New Jersey. All right. Way to progress up, Oregon. Well, I mean, Oregon's pretty progressive in a lot of aspects, but, well, we're working on the vaccines. We'll we'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and she says, we, when I'm the native Oregonian. Oh, I'm from Idaho. So much worse. Yeah. So much worse. <laughs> <laughs> and voters in Ireland have approved marriage equality by referendum, making them the first nation to do so by popular vote. Should be noted, they follow uh, three U.S. states, including Maryland and Washington, uh, who did the same thing. I'm forgetting which New England state it was that was the other one. Uh, anyway, the the government has until the end of June uh, to enact the laws needed to allow this. Ireland also has a three-month waiting period from the time someone registers their wedding date until they can actually get married. Sweetie, we've been screwed with the pl- change in plans we made. I know, totally screwed. Thank you, yeah. Idaho, for no waiting period. And also I- kind of creepy, though. In Idaho, you walk in, you show them your ID, you sign one form, pay them $30, and you can get married right then if you've got somebody to do it. Yeah, yeah, right then. Um, oh, oh, and look, you can look over that sheet about HIV sometime. Mm-hmm. So the, this, this three-month waiting period in Ireland would push it out further, but the government has said that they will be allowing couples who have registered their intent to enter a civil partnership, which they approved a few years ago, to update that registration to marriage without extending the waiting period. Uh, Of note with this is that 84% of the population of the Republic of Ireland identifies as Catholic, and the Catholic Church strongly opposed marriage equality. 62% of voters approved the amendment. A little bit of discord there. Like There's been some some harsh words said down in (laughs) Italia regarding this, but they did what the people wanted. Yep. And the Catholics are wondering what the hell happened to Ireland. I got drunk. <laughs> no, they actually did something good to make, to make people happy. Pro-humanitarian, that's, that's nice. Yeah. And uh, moving from Ireland to uh, Britain, uh, a seven-year-old British boy has been taken from his mother and placed in foster care because of the danger of the indoctrination he was going through. The issues all started when he refused to see his father because he did not believe in Jehovah, told his teachers that he rejected his father for those reasons. They then became more worried when he started cutting up religious education materials because he couldn't handle learning about mainstream Christianity. A seven-year-old getting taught religion in a public school. What the hell is wrong with you, Britain? Seriously. Um... Anyway, he also had a very small group of friends and rejected most of the rest of the kids. A psychologist working for the court found that he would have uh, physical reactions to mentions that Jesus died on a cross 
and references to the Bible, since young children should be perfectly fine hearing about the horrifically gruesome execution of one of their favorite superheroes, obviously. The mother had made a legally binding commitment to not talk to her son about religion, take him to church, or pray with him. Now, this is a fairly common agreement between um, two, two different religious parents, right? I mean, this is not, it's not weird. It's not anything I've ever heard of before. No. Oh. Well, I would have figured that if a Christian married an atheist, the atheist said, ah, I'm not really comfortable with you indoctrinating our children. In the U.S., the Christian would always win. Oh, that's true. And in Britain, uh, we talked to Anonymous Steve a while back, and they told him that he's an atheist, that he had to take his kids to Catholic Mass. The mom didn't even ask for that. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, the, the mom had uh, tried to get these eased up because all of these restrictions were under threat of losing custody of her son or facing criminal prosecution. And once she tried to get them eased up, the judge put him in foster care. The judge found that the boy had suffered emotional harm from the conflict between the parents. And, I quote, immersion by his mother in her religious beliefs and practices. The conclusion was that she was doing this to alienate him from his father. And considering the ruling against Anonymous Steve, I guess there is legal precedent in Britain for a judge to dictate what kind of religious indoctrination a child must have. And I do get that religious indoctrination can be harmful for children, uh, but I think I would start with doctrines on hell, original sin, and sexual repression. Yeah, I, I was raised UU. You know, we learned about everything right up front when we were little. Uh, and I can kind of feel for this kid. You know, going into a school and not knowing or not fully understanding what all the other people understand, it can be frustrating. Um, the first time somebody told me about the miracle of some guy getting swallowed by a fish, or that blew my mind. I'm like, wait, so what's the, is this like the moral of the story? Is this an anecdote or something? People are like, no, this guy actually was swallowed by like a whale. Like, what? No, no. So there's, there's discord there, and it can kind of cause your brain to just kind of go, uh, no, done with this. Don't want to don't want to deal with it anymore. And that sounds like exactly what this kid did. Um, he just happened to do it in apparently a very aggressive way. Yeah. It's really sad that this kid got stuck between two parents who were just fighting and using him as, as ammunition. Well, I'm sure the dad just wanted to see his son. And I'm sure the mom just wanted him to not see his dad. Yeah. And after winning the uh, re-election, the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, has announced that he will be seeking a ban on, quote, poisonous uh, Islamic ideology. This will include the bans on extremist organizations and the power to close premises and target charities who fund extremists and terrorists. I would really like to see how this could work and where you draw the line. Right, because on paper it sounds sounds okay. You're like, oh, well, that's all right. We don't want money going to people with, with, with guns and stuff down in the Middle East. But at what point do you start shutting down, you know, Islamic centers and targeting people who look and act differently from mm-hmm. you and segregating and so on and so forth? Yeah, it's, it's going to be hard to draw the line there. Uh, what? What's poisonous and what's not? So this will be interesting to see what happens. But as we have seen with British legal precedent, they don't have religious freedom. So I guess they can do that. In the Netherlands, the Dutch government has announced that it will be introducing uh, legislation in the parliament that would ban face coverings in schools, hospitals, government offices, and public transportation. This would apply to uh, ski masks, helmets, and full face veils. Prime Minister Mark Root said that it, quote, had nothing to do with religion. In a free country like the Netherlands, everyone has the right to dress how they choose, no matter what others think. That freedom is only limited in situations where it is essential for people to look at each other. Well, that seems kind of redundant when he says it like that. Yeah. Um, Basically, it is limited when national or local security is threatened by not being able to identify the person under the mask. 
Um, guess they're not. I guess they're not fans of Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so no uh, Halloween masks in schools, hospitals, government offices, or public transportation. Suck. And what this, uh, like, like we talked uh, last week with with Hina, uh, if you don't allow Muslim women to go into public wearing what they feel is modest, they won't go out in public. They will be trapped in their homes. And I totally get it when you have a legitimate security concern, when you have to verify somebody's ID. I get it then, but they're going a lot past that. Yeah, for a traditional, you know, girl to who is told from the time that she can stand and walk that, you know, her body is is precious and it can't be shown to just everybody. And then she enters public school and they tell her to rip off her veil. That can be a little disconcerting for for those, you know, for those girls. Now, it's kind of devil's advocate. I personally feel that you know, the, the face veils are a result of a patriarchal society, yada, yada, yada. But I can also see it from their point of view where I wouldn't want to have the government tell me that I have to go around without a tank top or, you know, I have to wear short shorts mm-hmm. or feel or, or wear stuff that makes me feel immodest. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. And in a pub, especially the public school, that's the one that really I have a problem with that. Yeah. I have a problem with that. <laughs> yeah. Now, we do have some some feedback coming up on that uh, a little bit later. And uh, GOP presidential candidate uh, Jeb Bush, brother of one former President Bush and son of the other, was recently interviewed by the Christian Broadcasting Network. And let's hear one of the ridiculous things he said. A big country, a tolerant country, ought to be able to figure out the difference between discriminating against someone because of their sexual orientation and not you know, forcing someone to participate in a wedding that they find um, goes against their, their moral beliefs. That, that, we should be able to figure this out. This should not be this complicated, but gosh, it is right now. Yeah, it's, it's really complicated because, you know, if you, say you live in a small town in southeastern Idaho where everyone's Mormon and you have a, a same sex marriage you want and you want to get a, you know, get flowers because who doesn't want flowers at their wedding? But everybody there is a good Mormon and they don't want to give you flowers because ooh, gay marriage, yuck. And you can't get flowers at your wedding. Yeah. I, I, I can see both sides of the argument here though. You know, there's always that sign in every business and we have the right to to not serve and it sucks but is, don't businesses kind of have that right when you become a business and you're open to the public yeah they put the sign that they reserve the right to refuse service to anyone for any reason uh, if they do they will be sued because they are a business of public accommodation which means they cannot discriminate against people if you have a business of public accommodation. Which is what, exactly? A normal business, <laughs> i.e. not a church. Oh. Uh, you can't decide that you won't serve a black person because they're black. You can't say that you won't serve gay customers. Well, okay, unless you're in a small town in Idaho, then you can discriminate against gays and lesbians. Uh, but your racism... If you're a florist, even if you don't deny black people the right to buy flowers from you, you can't deny interracial couples the right, even if it uh, violates your religious beliefs. And there, there's few left, but, but a, they lot are of, out there. a lot of Christians believe that interracial marriage is immoral, or at least historically have. And if you won't serve interracial couples you will get sued for racial discrimination. The reason for that is if you allow people to discriminate, you allow a segment of the population to be denied services. And if you are denied common services that everybody else has access to because of something about you, then you are denied an equal place in society. If you can't get flowers for your wedding, then... Your wedding is not equal to weddings where people can get flowers. All right. So, uh, yeah, Jeb, there it is. 
if you're a big tolerant country, you should make sure that everyone in that country has full access to all services. And finally for the news, an anti-gay church let their domain name expire. Uh, this is the Open Door Baptist Church. And I, I suggest you think Westboro Light. Uh, their website was Warnings of Wrath. And it used to point to the church's website. Now it redirects to scaryfuckers.com, a very hardcore tattooed gay skinhead porn site. Wait, gay skinhead? Yes. Okay. Something for everyone out there. Uh, I've, I've heard about this kind of stuff on the Savage Love cast. Uh, with it's kind of like women with rape fantasies. There are gay men with, well, I guess discrimination fantasies. You get weird things being uh, they get fetishized, and so yeah, it makes sense. Um, and to to quote the man who bought the domain, uh, they condemned gays and rock music outside of Carolina Rebellion. I bought the unexpectedly expired domain from their signs and pointed at a gay porn of people who probably like rock music. Fair? Fair. Yeah. So now when they go around with their signs for warnings of wrath, okay, what kind of seems backwards here is it was telling gays to turn from their, their sinful ways. And now it's telling gays that they might be brutally fucked by skinheads. That sounds almost as bad unless you're into that. I'm assuming it's consensual. Yeah. You can be gay and still hate the blacks. (laughs) It's messed up. Yeah. That's messed up. Anyway. It's it's a fetish site. If you can think of it, it it exists on the internet. And uh, we've got some some feedback. And uh, first off is from Ben Meyer via voicemail. Hello, Atheist Nomads. My name is Ben Meyer. I've been listening to your show for about three months now. And I got to say, it's one hell of a show. You guys, you guys really open up my mind to a lot of different things, and uh, I'm a new, I'm a newly discovered atheist myself. So I've been kind of, you know, back and forth with, you know, just taking that into stride and and you know doing all of that and just finding myself basically. And um, I'm also a paleontologist uh, buff too, and I love that you guys cover some of the some of that stuff like uh, the the show that was today, uh, May 14th, when you were talking about how they were converting, like, uh, uh, beaks to snouts and stuff like that. I thought that that was really fascinating. Um, anyways, uh, um, once I can figure it out, I'd be much more than happy to, to send you guys a donation. Um, uh, thanks for the support, and, uh, you know, as cheesy as it may sound, keep on trucking. Bye. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, that means a lot. One of the things that we are here for is helping uh, new atheists find their place. And it's it's a scary thing to be surrounded by a bunch of religious people and realize you're not one of them, that you're different than everybody else. And so I, I'm glad we were able there to, to help you through that early early transition. All right. This is a email from Emily. Hi, guys. You produce a fantastic podcast and are awesome people. As a godless heathen trans person, I find you two to be very down to earth. And when you speak about LGBT and more specifically to me, trans issues, you make me feel accepted and you treat all of what you cover with great respect, which I love. Just thank you again for your awesome show. A donation will follow up this email from the buckle of the Bible belt in Nashville, Tennessee, Emily. Ah, Thank you, Emily. Uh, Like in in my case, and I can't speak for for Wesley on, on all of this, but. In the last eight years, I have had to undo 23 years of indoctrination. That included a lot of sexism, homophobia, transphobia, and frankly, the last one I finally came to a good place on was trans issues. I I had an easier time empathizing with gay and lesbian issues because it's just loving someone that you love and being rejected by a bunch of religious bigots. I have had a hard time empathizing with trans issues because I am a cisgender male. I cannot understand what you're going through, but I can sure as hell sympathize that it's a tough process and that we need to just accept people for 
who they are. And that's actually a point where I can empathize because every human deserves to be accepted and loved and respected for who they are. And where that comes from is what's inside of our heads. And our hearts. <laughs> yeah, that one was a punch right in the feels. Yeah. That was good. And you know, we have we have we strive to be good allies and I'm I'm glad that's that's working. Uh it's it's been one of those where I have especially when it comes to trans issues, I've I've worried that we aren't doing enough to be good allies. And so it's I'm I'm glad to get that that reassurance. So thank you very much, Emily. Yeah, in the LGBT um, world, the B and the T oftentimes gets dropped. Uh, it's it's very easy to go out and, you know, proudly present yourself as being a gay or lesbian. But bisexuality and transsexuality and pansexuality is really something that society hasn't caught up on yet. And so the people who are in those situations right now, any support is good support. And also asexuals and... So many other groups. It's it's becoming a, a alphabet soup. It is. It is. Um, but you, you're right. As long as you have the, the firm moral ground of where every human being has a certain right, until people start claiming that they're no longer human beings, that's a pretty good umbrella. Yeah. And uh, from Mossab via the website, because my English is very badly, so I want to put this video of debate between Muslim woman and woman from other religion. And left a link to a YouTube video. I did watch it. Um, the video is actually a debate between two Muslim women. One who is wearing a full face veil. And the other one is not even wearing a headscarf. The one not wearing the headscarf is arguing for legislation to restrict being able to wear headscarves in public. And definitely veils in public. While the veiled woman is fighting, arguing for her right to wear a veil in public and actually acknowledges that for identification pictures and going through security checkpoints, she takes off her veil, but she's a lot more comfortable in public with it on. And she's a mechanical engineer. Yeah, these are not housebound, uh, you know, housewives that want to, you know, that this argument is centered around. So some of these women, I mean, they've got PhDs. Yeah. It's, but again, if you don't let them wear the scarf, they're going to become housebound. Yeah. Because they're not going to walk out into public naked. Yeah. And that's, uh, women are fighting hard enough. They don't need one more. And from Hyde Hill, also via the website, uh, this part is often skipped in the headscarf debate and just thought it deserved mention. The wearing of the headscarf was also criticized as a means to enforce peer pressure on the girls not wearing it. A relevant issue was that the relevant group being pressured was Muslim girls not wearing the scarf who could sometimes be endangered inside or outside school unless they s submitted to wearing the scarf like their classmates. So it's not just about those wearing the scarf. It's similar to forced conformity when, uh, when prayers were led by teachers and you had to leave if you didn't want to. And now it was student to student. Uh, I think that's blurring the issue. Um, the headscarf is not the problem in this type of a scenario. It is bullying and peer pressure. Yeah, the scarf is just the way of bullying and peer pressuring. And, um, well, I, I understand what he's saying, that a lot of these girls are going to wear it because they're going to get picked on at school if they don't. Um, the point really is whether or not legislatively they have the right to tell Mm -hmm. people that they can or cannot wear. Unfortunately, when it comes especially to schools, girls and boys, they're going to get picked on no matter what. Yeah. I got bullied relentlessly for years for being smart. I think it was the red hair, but he thinks it's... That because, was also a factor. Yeah. Uh, I was the, yeah, I was the only ginger there. And then with puberty, my hair turned to where the gingers don't even accept me anymore. Oh, dark Irish. So sad. And most of the... The uh, b bullying that we hear about now is LGBT kids getting bullied. And now we've got a case being talked about with Muslim girls who don't want to wear the headscarf being bullied. The problem isn't being gay. The problem isn't whether or not you wear a headscarf. The problem isn't whether or not you're smart. The problem is the bullying. And 
It will require a cultural shift to end the bullying, just like it will take a cultural shift to break the rape culture. Both of these have to be done, and they have to start early in school. If you start telling kids in kindergarten what is and is not appropriate conduct, and you keep reinforcing that over and over and over, and if we make other reforms, such as allowing teachers to appropriately intervene to protect a student from violent bullying, if we increase the likelihood of police being there to address it, uh, if we make sure there are harsh penalties when bullying does take place, we can put a stop to bullying. It can happen, and it's well worth it. Because the scars from bullying stick with you. Uh, the, the damage from the, the social isolation that can come with it can be something that you may never fully recover from it. There are some things you need to learn at certain points in your development. And if you miss out on learning those, there are some cues that you will just never pick up on. There are trust issues that can develop that will never be undone. I was in uh, freshman year of college, I got counseling and I was diagnosed with mild anxiety and mild paranoia. Both of those the counselor traced to the bullying I went through. I still struggle with both of those. Bullying has left me with permanent psychological damage. And I had very light bullying compared to what a lot of kids go through. So, yeah, we, we need to address and we need to fix the bullying problem so more kids don't grow up and end up screwed up adults. Now, I like to think I'm pretty okay, but... Every so often, uh, the anxiety starts to get to me, and on very rare occasions, I get into a paranoia spiral, and it can be really hard, especially once that starts picking up on the, the, the anxiety starts picking up on that. It can be really hard to shut that down, to rationally tell yourself that, no, they aren't out to get you. It can be really difficult. I'm lucky uh, all my bullying was self-inflicted. <laughs> I, I thought I was being bullied when I wasn't, but saying I was got me attention. So I was one of those kids. Whole nother se- separate set of problems. Yeah. But if we, if we taught teachers better about how to identify and, and address bullying, and I think at this point it really should be a full college course for anybody wanting to be a teacher, uh, they could have figured out, wait a minute, no, this girl is saying she's being bullied. She's not. Maybe she should go see the counselor. <laughs> Maybe she just needs some bullies. Maybe she wanted... <laughs> why wasn't I good enough to have bullies? No, I actually... Aww. I did have it. I, I had it really easy. Really easy. But yeah, there are some people who's... I mean, they're afraid to go to school for their lives. It's, it's sad. And uh, yeah, better education. And being able to understand how bullying adapts. Um you know, it's one thing to stop a kid from punching another kid. It's another to keep them from texting something or sharing something on Facebook. Yeah. That's a lot harder, and we're still learning a lot on how to deal with that. So, ooh, here's to psychology. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at contactatheistnomads.com. Call us at 541-203-0666, or hit us up on the website or on Facebook or Twitter. Because, you know, the social medias are pretty awesome. We do definitely prefer voicemail. I uh, love being able to play your voice on the show rather than me or this time Lauren reading it for everyone. Um, better to hear your, your words in your own voice. And for the 100th episode, uh, what we'd like to get is a number of messages. Again, preferably voicemail, but we could do, um, we could read your messages as well with how you found out about us. And what difference we have made for you. Uh, We'll be collecting these for episode 100. And it'd be nice to have a couple minutes worth. We, you, you hear from us every week and it'd be nice to be able to hear from you. Yeah. You should see his eyes when he gets a, it gets a positive reinforcement. It's great. It's like a dog seeing a treat. Like from Ben and Emily. Yes. Yes. So keep giving him treats. Uh, on the way home from work, I, I read Emily's message to Lauren. It was so so heartwarming. Oh, heartwarming. And for uh, supporters, we got two new ones. A uh, new nuclear sponsor, Daryl Goosen, and a new gold sponsor, Mark Seafried. 
So thank you, Daryl and Mark. Uh, we still do have the 100 by 100 campaign. That was the goal to get to $100 per episode by episode 100. There are four episodes left. You've got a month to get in on this, and we're at $49 an episode. Yeah, this was, uh, I, I think, lack of marketing on their parts. This would be awesome, though, if you can get up to, uh, maybe realistically, let's get up to like 75. Yeah, but 100 for 100, that's that would be cool. Um, I personally would prefer two or 300, because mm. I just lost my job, so... This would be, uh, yeah, you know, let let them have some of your cash. It would be, yeah. it would, it's going to a good place. Making sure that we can eat. <laughs> Making sure that Rocco Taco, the Chihuahua, can eat. Aww. Think, think of the puppies. Aww. Aww. Don't worry, we'll starve long before he starves. Yes, yes. And he doesn't eat much. It's only a quarter cup of, twice a day. Anyway, thank you all <laughs> for, for listening. Lauren, thank you for filling in for Wesley. And we will be back at you next week with an interview. Woohoo! Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541 203 0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomads.